During the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were often thought of as having opposing views about how to achieve equality and black rights. But what if they actually represented a single mind, a single consciousness, a singular path towards rending what the sociologist and historian W.E.B. Du Bois called the veil? For Du Bois, black consciousness in America lived under a shadow of discrimination, with no true self-consciousness. He wrote that it's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings. When Sam Hose was lynched in Georgia in 1889, Du Bois wrote in his autobiography that he had penned a rational letter to the editorial office of the Atlanta Constitution protesting the lynching. But when he discovered that Hose had been barbecued and dismembered in front of a crowd of 2,000 people, he wrote, One could not be a calm, cool and detached scientist while Negroes were being lynched, murdered and starved. We see in Du Bois then two sides. One rational, one emotive, one thoughtful, one angry. Almost 70 years later, we see these two sides personified in the figures of King and Malcolm X. King is most recognized as the leader of the non-violent struggle, wanting rights through legislation. Malcolm X, on the other hand, is usually cited as the leader of those who wanted freedom by any means, and for years argued for black nationalism. We see in them both a common assumption that rationality and emotion are opposed to each other. But are they? King drew upon Hegel's belief that history progresses through rationality. In his autobiography, Stride Towards Freedom, he discusses the philosophers that influenced him. He believed in careful, thoughtful debate and discourse, the synthesis of opposing positions. King drew on the dominant discourse of American history and Christianity. He said that he tried to write speeches that were militant enough to keep my people aroused to positive action, and yet moderate enough to keep this fervour within controllable and Christian bounds. This meant that for some black nationalists, King got the reputation of being, in his own words, a sort of polished Uncle Tom. He, though, thought that democracy and segregation were diametrically opposed and condemned black nationalism on the same lines. Black nationalism was to King sectional, with no moral balance. King's rationality comes from Hegelianism, the rational synthesis of opposing views, how opposite ideas can't live with each other. For Malcolm X, on the other hand, to unite with the slave master was a ridiculous sight, he wrote. Islam was for him a way to break free from the discourse of America and Christianity, which he thought would never rationally accept black people. He described joining the Nation of Islam as a psychologically revitalizing moment, and he wrote in his autobiography that in his younger years, the idea of being a hustler was a way to escape the dominant discourse, the norms, codes and cultural life of America, to move away from what was accepted as rational in the American consciousness. The hustler out there in the ghetto jungles, he wrote, has less respect for the white power structure than any other Negro in North America. The ghetto hustler is internally restrained by nothing. He has no religion, no concept of morality, no civic responsibility, no fear, nothing. For King, violence was irrational. He told his followers to love your enemies. As a minority in the richest country on earth, King thought nonviolence was both impractical and immoral. Malcolm X, on the other hand, wanted freedom by whatever means necessary. Again, like rationality and emotion, rationality and violence are usually defined as opposed to each other. But again, is this really the case? How do we conceptualize what rationality even is? The sociologist Max Weber said that rationality was to define an end that was pursued and calculated. But what if emotion helps you reach that end, that goal? The philosopher Martin Heidegger noted how different states of mind disclose different things in the world. They illuminate the world in different ways. 
For Heidegger, we are always in a state of mind. Comfortable or uncomfortable, hungry or tired, fearful or meditative. States of mind are determinative, yet Heidegger argues they have been banished to the sanctuary of irrationality. If we are hungry, food will become illuminated. If we are angry, that which makes us angry will be the focus of our mind. Heidegger discusses fear as an example of a state of mind. He notes that there are variations in the phenomenon of fear. You can fear something present or specific. You can fear for others. You can dread something. There is fear that expresses itself as timidity, shyness, misgiving, becoming startled. But all of these emotions determine how you see the world in the moment. Malcolm X uses anger as a tool of mobilization, while King instead emphasized calmness. In this sense, both can be perfectly rational. Emotions contribute to social action and work in tandem with what we traditionally define as rationality. When traveling around Africa in 1964, Malcolm X noticed that where areas had achieved their independence, someone had gotten angry. He remarked that usually when people are sad, they don't do anything, but when they get angry, they bring about change. When they get angry, they aren't interested in logic, they aren't interested in odds, they aren't interested in consequences. On the famous March on Washington in 1963, the march of Martin Luther King's famous speech, Malcolm X writes, who ever heard of angry revolutionists all harmonizing we shall overcome some day while tripping and swaying along arm in arm with the very people they were supposed to be angrily revolting against? Who ever heard of angry revolutionists swinging their bare feet together with their oppressor in lily pad park pools with gospels and guitars and I have a dream speeches? For Malcolm X, all the march did was lull people for a while before the anger rekindled deeper than ever. Even King was worried that some people would misunderstand the peace and the quiet and the tranquility of the march. Despite this, Malcolm X wrote that he never let himself get over-emotional and angry. Likewise, King had said that segregation makes me almost angry. In his account of the Montgomery bus boycott in Stride Towards Freedom, King places a premium on calmness. He writes that this is the time that we must evidence calm dignity and wise restraint. Emotions must not run wild. Violence must not come from any of us. Nonviolence, according to King, recognizes the need for moving towards the goal of justice with wise restraint and calm reasonableness. Even when his house was bombed, King, while he was on the verge of corroding hatred, would not allow himself to become bitter. He constantly asked God to remove all bitterness from my heart. King wrote that the force expressed by Elijah Muhammad's Muslim movement is one of bitterness and hatred and it comes perilously close to advocating violence. But the one thing certain about bitterness, he wrote, is its blindness. Towards the end of their lives, King and Malcolm X both made changes to their philosophies. It's contentious by how much, but Malcolm X arguably became less radical, and King more so. Malcolm X told a reporter though, I haven't changed, I just see things on a broader scale. It seems though that their positions were more likely complementary rather than contradictory, appealing to two sides of all of our brains, what Daniel Kahneman calls System 1 and System 2. System 1 is fast, instinctive, emotional, and System 2 is a slower, more logical, methodological system. It seems likely though that both King and Malcolm X were acutely aware of this and used it to their advantage. And it speaks volumes of the collective unconsciousness, the collective System 1 and System 2, that regulates movements in societies. Psychiatrist and philosopher Frantz Fanon wrote that I had rationalized the world and the world had rejected me on the basis of color prejudice. Since no agreement was possible on the level of reason, I threw myself back toward unreason. That all men are created equal. 
Thank you to August Aghast for providing the incredible music for this video, plus this great song you're hearing right now. Check out his SoundCloud through the link in the description below. It's really, really good. If you like these videos and want to support Then and Now, then here's my request. If you think you get as much value from four of these videos as you do from just one cup of coffee, then please consider pledging just one dollar towards the creation of each new video on Patreon, where you can even limit your pledge to just a dollar per month. If you subscribe below then please make sure to hit that bell to make sure you get alerted to new videos and you can follow me on twitter and facebook in the links in the description below thanks to all my existing patrons and see you next week